Hey everyone, and welcome to this episode of Food for Thought, a series of conversations where we talk with business owners, entrepreneurs, philanthropists, and thought leaders in the Jewish community. I want to thank our sponsor, the Hebrew Free Loan of San Francisco, for supporting our Northern California Jewish community for 124 years. And this series of conversations is another way to offer resources and support to our community. My name is Roman Polnar, I'm your host, and on behalf of Hebrew Free Loans Business Circle, I'm excited to have this conversation with a special guest and a very good friend, Steve Grau, CEO of Royal Ambulance. Now, before I turn this over to Steve, I want to tell you a little bit about him. Because when I think of Steve, I think of a real American success story. See, Steve immigrated with his family from Ukraine in 1989, arriving in San Francisco with just $80 to their name, and he eventually became interested in healthcare, giving, having a very personal experience that inspired him to start an ambulance company. And for the last 16 years, he's built Royal Ambulance from just 10 employees and two ambulances to over 650 employees, 100 ambulances serving six Bay Area counties, providing over 80,000 transports per year. Now, in that time, Royal Ambulance has been voted 125 best companies to work for in the Bay Area. Inc. Magazine ranked them one of the fastest growing companies in America. Modern Healthcare awarded them best places to work in Glassdoor employee-driven sentiment ranking of top 25% medium businesses in the country. Look, none of these things happen by accident. So I'll be asking Steve about some of the key markers of his success. But in addition, Steve also takes a very active role in the Jewish community. He's a big supporter of the Hebrew Free Loan. And on top of it all, he's got an absolutely wonderful family. So like I said, a true American success story. So I'm excited to have this conversation with Steve. I think you will too, especially if you want to grow and scale your business. So Steve, welcome to Food for Thought. Thank you so much for having me, Roman. I'm uh, humbled to be here. I uh, shared with you on the way here, I sort of listened to your past interviewer. Eric has been a tremendous uh, success story as us immigrants go. And I'm just humbled to follow up uh, this notable uh, interviewee and podcast member. So thank you for having oh, Thank me. you. I know you've got a story to share as well. And so, what, I mean, there's so many places where we can start, but I think the best place to start from this from the beginning. So tell us a little bit about how you got into healthcare. What made you go into it? What made you start Royal Ambulance? And I know that Hebrew Philone had a role to play, so maybe you can expand upon that as well. Absolutely. I, I'm very grateful to Hebrew Free Loan for providing me uh, not one, but two loans. Uh, one of the loans is actually was for my first career, uh, which was in tech, and uh, they gave me a loan to go to a computer learning center. Uh, you know, I, I, I openly share that uh, early on uh, after we immigrated, uh, school was not my friend. I attended about four public high schools, including one in Israel. And uh, it, it definitely was a turbulent uh, adulthood for me. Uh, but uh, when I attended Computer Learning Center, as I was tired of doing uh, a whole bunch of different jobs from uh, being a commercial plumber to working in an auto shop, I thought, let's put this thing that uh, my mama gave me to work uh, and uh, let's use our brains instead of our hands, which uh, put me uh, in about a five year stint in uh, technology. I started as a programmer, quickly learned that sitting behind computer and paying attention to context doesn't work well between my dyslexia and ADD and I'm much better communicating and solving problems in a different way. Um, I think in general, I think for anybody who is searching for where to apply themselves. I think this is a really important consideration is uh, figuring out what you can be passionate about, like what gets you up in the morning and what drives you, what gets you excited. And I think that word passion is a little bit, of course, overused because, you know, another uh, perspective that I've heard recently that passion is, you know, it comes from this Latin word suffering. And it ultimately is what are you willing to suffer for? Uh, and uh, <laughs> which is, you know, I think a good descriptor because when you go on this journey and you try to build something and whether you're trying to build something or you're just, uh, you know, we're not just, but you're playing a role in an organizational development. It's not always that we get up in the morning and we jump up and we think, oh my God, I'm going to go do the work of my life. A lot of times you're going to have to do things you don't like in order to 
puts you in a place which drives you ultimately towards your ambitions, desires. And sometimes it's a, you know, an interesting process, but something inside you says, I need to be on this track. Uh, and the other part is what can you be good at, right? I think uh, what I've learned along the way that I'm good at looking at a broader picture and then connecting the dots and solving problems, which is kind of what brought me into healthcare. And the other part is, which is important is, you know, what fuels your economic engine and how do you sustain the ideals of your lifestyle? You know, where you have, as you mentioned, a beautiful family, we like to explore and experience, experience the world. So I think figuring out how those aspects of your life will come together. Um, after um, I started my tech career, I, you know, I've done it for about five years, but something internally was uh, making me look for something more meaningful where I can make impact. And healthcare is just one of those things that you get to experience the impact you make on other people's lives in a very direct way, especially if you're a hands-on caregiver. And I think there's very many careers out there that give you this opportunity to experience human side of impact. And um, uh, my story started in a very um, interesting way. My grandfather, who we immigrated here from Ukraine, uh, suffered a debilitating stroke. Uh, I ended up being involved with this care coordination, again, because of my flexible schedule and other things and watching him transition from hospital to home uh, with home health to skilled nursing to uh, dealing with uh, OT, uh, occupational th therapist, uh, physical therapist, learning how to gain his speech and mobility back really opened up my perspectives and how meaningful the work is that the caregivers provide. And so that was sort of the catalyst of saying, hey, I'm not fe feeling super fulfilled in this career that I'm at. How do I get more meaning out of the time that I devote towards uh, my career, towards how I make an impact as an individual? And, you know, ultimately, you know, we all ask that question, you know, why am I here? What can I contribute to the world? And, you know, it's a difficult question. Sometimes you learn what you don't like, uh, a lot easier than figuring out what you do like. And then, then ultimately it's an element of trying and building little hypotheses and prototypes in order to test what can you be good at, what can you be passionate about and what is gonna drive your economic engine from that perspective. So I know that you got into the healthcare space out of that personal experience. And I, it's interesting that you mentioned that suffering has a root, or sorry, success has a root in suffering. Passion, passion. Passion, passion. Thank you for clarifying. Uh, because it often feels when you're you know, running a small enterprise or a business, it's a, almost a daily process of suffering that drives your passion. But tell me a little bit about what the journey was like. I mean, I know you started Royal Ambulance with, what, about 10 people and two ambulances and... Not that long ago, 15, 16 years later, you're 650 employees and 100 ambulances. Take us through that journey. Absolutely. Th thanks for asking. And, you know, it's always uh, interesting to reflect and, you know, it, it, comparatively, it, being in Silicon Valley, it's very hard not to look outside of your lane uh, when you're running your race and look at the other lane and say, oh my God, the scalability in Silicon Valley plays a completely different perspective than it is when you're trying to scale your small, you know, to medium sized business. But um, I digress, I'll tell you, yes, uh, you know, I uh, early on, I didn't know how to get into healthcare, but EMS is that one of those a really fascinating fields and EMS is emergency medical services. This is uh, the ambulance service. Uh, there's hospital care and pre-hospital care. Some, this is when you call 911. And this is the difference, by the way, just to clarify for everybody. Uh, we're an ambulance company, just like a 911 company is an ambulance company, except most of our work comes from contracting with hospitals and dozens of dozens, home health, hospice, uh, skilled nursing facility. We serve everybody in the care continuum. We don't necessarily 
contract with the county 911 systems. It's a slightly different sport, uh, requires a, a lot of different skills in order to be successful there. I don't want to spend time anal over analyzing it, but what we do is we connect patients and providers in this care continuum to make sure that we enable a variety of important factors, and I'll touch upon that in a minute. Let me go back to uh, my personal journey space. Yes, I ended up uh, becoming an EMT, um, worked for a couple of small companies, uh, quite honestly, didn't learn en enough to uh, go start and lead and manage a business. So I've had thousands of mistakes along the way, ultimately continue making hundreds of them a week, I would say. Uh, is just my comfort level with how I make mistakes and how I talk to myself after making those mistakes has evolved over time. <laughs> uh, but yes, we, we, we did start with uh, uh, 10 ambulances. And by the way, this is where Hebrew Free Loan was very, very helpful to me in, in my journey. Initially, I got a student loan to go to Computer Learning Center. And once I paid it off and, you know, maybe a half a dozen years later, I came to Hebrew Free Loan and asked uh, for a loan for uh, my ambulance number three and number four. Because after we took on um, uh, debt against our mortgage with my wife, I uh, ended up uh, needing to scale. And so we came to Hebrew Free Loan and they seeded us some money to buy additional vehicles. So I'm uh, obviously forever grateful. I you know, try to repay that gratitude by being active with the agency, as well as, you know, participating in variety of uh, committees and causes that can help uh, pro uh, propel the cause. Um, I'll pause and see if I missed something that you wanted to know more of and where I can get more detailed on things that you think can help others. Yeah, well, I think there are. You know, I think one of the things that I, I know you're very proud of, and it's one of those things that, I know you've worked very, very hard to create, is a certain recognition of your brand, that Royal stands for more than just the logo. It's more than just the name. I know that you have a, a theory where you're serving different sides of your business internally through your employees, your patients, as well as the service providers, and you take great pride in creating that consistency um, of the brand. Talk to us a little bit about that. Because I think at the end of the day, most of our, or at least a lot of our listeners are business owners, or they want to be business owners. And I think that's a very, very important message that I'd love for you to talk about. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I, I, I think there is a perspective to, it's not just the brand, but the culture that represents the brand. Because the brand is an element, is an evolving element, right? It, it, it is... Uh, this much of a logos, it's a tiny piece of it. it. It is a tiny piece of the slogans, but it's more about what are your customers are saying about you? What are your employees presenting and saying about you? What are, what, what are your haters saying? What are your publications are saying? So it's a, mm -hmm. it's a real evolving character of the organization that ends up speaking for itself. And so ultimately, you know, for us, um, it started resonating on how do you continue building that and you have to ultimately come down to what is your mission. When you become clear about your mission and who you serve and ultimately the elements of your service, what are they, um, what are they allowed to accomplish uh, for those who you serve? It becomes an important element if you would a drumbeat of the organization. I mean, the two essential components that I would say um, any business owner uh, needs to start thinking, articulating, and consistently working through on, or it's a never ending uh, sort of quest, is be clear about your mission and make sure that the organizational values align. And I'll explain both. There's another important component, which is the vision. Vision part is where do you want to go? And then the mission part for me is how are we going to get there? So I'll, I'll leave the vision piece uh, off of it for, for a minute because I'll break down on how we uh, structured our mission and why it continues to deliver consistent results. And so for us, our mission, we have three key stakeholder groups, right? 
ultimately the people that we serve. And I'll even actually talk a little bit about how it evolved over time and what happened during COVID and why it shifted. So it, it ultimately at, at the onset, we knew that we kind of have this three-legged stool, meaning it's very, very important for us to address the patient's journey. Ultimately, anybody who joins our organization, the young and inspiring healthcare providers, and by the way, I would say 95% of people that come and join uh, a royal or organization like ours, a basic life support company that focuses primarily on an inter-facility, meaning transferring patients between the facilities, are brand new out of school. It, sometimes they haven't even had a job other maybe than Starbucks or something. Um, you know, so we try to uh, get some experience out of the service industry. And so ultimately, they have they come in and they need to gain all these skills. Well, how do we align around those skills where they start with the patient's journey? Because ultimately, people that join healthcare and we're very blessed like that are very uh, focused on their own personal mission, which is usually to give back uh, and help others, right? So when you already start with really good and meaningful individuals, and, and that's an important part, you got to know who you attract and what attracts them to your organization. And ultimately figuring out that, hey, our poor, part of our mission, number one, is we have to create positive experiences for the, our patients. That's how we, we, we word it. We want to positively impact patient's journey. It becomes less about clinical stuff and much more understanding that you are able to create a positive impact by the creating and designing the experience when you interact with a patient. And then, and then of course, we over the years, we build all kinds of tools to help learn and uh, create positive impact or elevate touch points as we put them and talk about that in detail a little bit more but ultimately let me fi finish the mission part it's about uh, uh it's about the patient's journey the other part of it is uh customer um making our customers jobs easier and you're like well aren't patients your customers and technically i would say they're not our customers because we serve other healthcare providers, other healthcare entities like large healthcare systems trust us to represent their brand and, cre and create solutions for them. So they hire us to do the job. So one of the early things we have to understand, and this is, a, by the way, a pretty published good framework to think about, it's called jobs to be done. What job is this person or customer or product ultimately is hired to do. So they hire us to, you know, make their lives easier, but also there's functional elements, improve patient flow. We've seen a lot of it during COVID, how it complex it becomes if patients are not able to transfer to the emergency departments, admitted to the hospital, where the bottlenecks are created. So what we do is we help solve those problems. And then lastly, and almost more importantly, and it's hard to sort of shift this points of importance, is how do we focus on developing our workforce? And as I mentioned, it's the individuals that come out right out of school, they're well-meaning, uh, they're focused on patient care and patient experience, but how do we focus our intent and energy on developing them, developing their skills, developing them professionally, and then developing their careers? So those are the three main aspects that help drive our organizational consistency. If the leaders in our organization, and you know, I'm very proud to say that uh, a lot of uh, my core leadership team started with me 15, 10, nine years ago so we've all kind of grown up together and we share that very close cultural and emotional understanding of what we're trying to accomplish so again focusing on the mission and then making sure that the values i.e ideas understandings and behaviors are shared and we can break those down but i just want to pause um and and see if i made any sense or brought any clarity into um, the dimension of starting with the mission, understanding the stakeholders and catering to those. Once you create clarity around that, then I think the organizational direction is going to flow a lot better.
So did you start with this clarity and developing a mission statement when you were still a 10 person company or did it take Absolutely a bit? Absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> no, as uh, it, it, it's, it's definitely has been an evolution. We definitely um, started developing it early on, like year number two, year number three. It is, look, it, it, the, the reality of the situation, when it's 10 of you and you're sitting around the table and you wake up in the morning, I'm in the office, uh, it, here was my schedule. <laughs> so I would... Uh, Come into the. I was an EMT. I would come in the office if there were shifts available. I would run some calls in the afternoon. I would go out there and do a lot of business development, meet with the customers. You know, make sure I understand what they need from us and how do we position our services. And at night, I was a night dispatcher. So because there's no volume, not enough volume at night for you to hire somebody. So I would have a phone that would uh, transfer to my cell phone and then I would do all three sort of daily. But when it's like you have 10 people and everybody is very close, sometimes you don't need to communicate things that are obvious. It's, the communication becomes very easy. But when your organization gets to 100 people and you start seeing the breakdown, you're like, why are you doing that? What are you doing? Why are you not doing that? Then it becomes, okay, okay, how do we start alignment? And then the alignment is one of the most important responsibility of any organizational leader. I think I'm, I, I'm a student of leadership. I'm, I'm consistently learning on how to evolve uh, my thoughts. That's where it all starts. And then my actions, right? And I think um, alignment is one of those core uh, necessary components. You know, people talk about managing by walking around. This is not dissimilar because you know what your intent is. And sometimes you've got to dig a couple of layers down, get on the front lines, get on the ambulance, um, and understand what's working and what's not in order for you to course correct. So I think that that would be my advice is know your mission, but also consistently check for alignment as it goes down to your frontline people. So I think one of the biggest challenges that small business owners have is that wearing multiple hats and never having enough time to do or act as the CEO. When you take a step back, you start to learn, you start to take stock of what needs to be done, who should do it. Talk to us a little bit about that transformation for you. At what point did you decide enough was enough? I need to work on my business, not just in my business. And what helped you make that transformation? I, I got to be honest here. I am still going through that transformation. <laughs> uh, it, a, absolutely. I, I think, um, especially as being owner operator, uh, we take on so much and sometimes we're so engulfed in the processes. Yeah, I'll give you an example, like sales and business development is a hat that I I'm accustomed to wearing. And then when you're growing, you start hiring people and then you're not just sales business development, but now you're a team leader. Now you have to be a sales training coach. Now you have to be a team manager. Now you have to manage the technology uh, that fuels your uh, sales team and variety of other factors. So you get really deep into the structural elements of it. And potentially that's where I would, um, rethink how I'm doing things now, well, how I did things before into considering how things now is one it, very interesting. Um, and, it, and this is a good book by uh, Dr. Dan Hardy, I think. It's uh, uh, Who, Not How. And, and that puts you in exactly that mindset. It's not how do I need to do this, but who should be doing this? I think when you start thinking about how do I build the best team with the people that are most qualified, aligned and fit in culturally, then I think you're, you'll have this ability not to be as on, on, in the weeds as much, not have as much pressure, not to come in and I'm like, I got 50 things I need to do. But ultimately, it's who are the best people to do the job? Because I promise you, you can't be better than everybody else. Um, and, you know, my uh, um, sort of answer to that lesson is I last year was super fortunate to 
onboard a, a very um, successful, intelligent uh, young leader. Uh, she's come uh, with a ton of experience and she completely trans, I, I think, transformed uh, the way that we do customer development, follow up and management in the ways that I could have never imagined. And so again, the sooner you start thinking in those terms, I think from the business perspective, the sooner you will start doing things you like more. And ultimately, somebody will hopefully be better at doing those things that you like less. Um, yeah. So That's that, an important, uh, my two cents. Yeah. important lesson to keep in mind. And actually, speaking of people, I know that you have a very uh, clear uh, philosophy about how to treat your employees, how to develop your employees, how to build a workforce that's well aligned in terms of how they're compensated, how they communicate. Um, talk to us a little bit about that. I know you mentioned like the, the perverse nature of sign on bonuses and that, you know, your employees actually are hiring you, not the other way around. So it's a very interesting perspective that I know that not often we hear enough about. So share that with us. Absolutely. I, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, right, we have these three key stakeholder groups and we're like, okay, uh, who is our primary? And so early on, we, and then there's a great HBR, uh, Harvard Business Review article that helps you create a format. How do you focus on, on who? And so ultimately we decided that we need to have a deep understanding of our customers because if they, we don't understand what they want, they won't hire us to do the job. Well, fast forward to now and uh, COVID has put an extraordinary strain on the whole healthcare system. Uh, it burned out a lot of uh, healthcare providers because of heightened demand. Now, because also limited the supply, the schools have been closed, uh, graduations haven't been happening. It hasn't, we haven't appropriately replenished um, our pipeline into healthcare. Royal is one of the organizations that develops healthcare leaders. And so ultimately, as I mentioned, people come to get this hands-on experience and then they look to develop their skill set and take it to other healthcare disciplines. Typically for us, the division is about 45, 50% of people want to go into the 911 system that's either fire or paramedicine. Uh, and then it breaks down um, probably 20% want to go into nursing, 20% want to go into uh, some form of mid level nurse practitioner, physician's assistants, or a physician. We have many people that go into medical school. And then the other people sometimes are looking to learn how to become better leaders. So ultimately, for us, we have to. It, what the pandemic did is it shifted our focus. Wait a minute. We have a. If we, we don't have enough EMTs or medics or nurses, we, then we cannot go serve the customer. So we really had to shift our prioritization into saying, we deeply understand customers. Now we need to continue deeply understand employees because as you mentioned, uh, they no longer get hired by us. They hire us to do a job for them. The job for them is how do we advance their healthcare careers? And once we deeply understand that element, what they want us to do, provide training, education, programs, uh, you know, make them competent communicators, make them competent clinicians, create internal opportunities, then they can be very successful. And it's that kind of mentality that focuses on, you know, organizational culture. Because if you know what, we're, we're a little bit like a college basketball team. And what I mean by that is, you know, historically, when you looked at NBA and professional teams, you had teams that were dynasties because they could, you know, have consistency and cornerstone players, guys like Steph, right? Guys like Clay that are going to be the cornerstone of the organization. You figure with that, we're like college basketball because you know in three years everybody's going to turn over. So how do you keep the short messaging but philosophies aligned that people can come in get understand dial in and then ultimately feel and execute based on those elements that you share in terms of your objectives in terms of your purpose in terms of your values and then ultimately that's i think how the culture happens 
Yeah, I love the different uh, perspective that it's not just about knowing your customer, knowing your employees, but it's really getting to know your stakeholders, as you call them. And there are, in any business, usually more than one. It's more than just the customer. There's also at least the employees, and perhaps, like in your case, there is a third. So I think it's a really, really great insight that any of us running small, mid, or large organizations should really consider and be thoughtful about who our stakeholders are and how to give them exactly what they're looking for, which is um, hopefully what's going to make them do their best within this ecosystem that you're creating for them to function in. That's right. That's right. I, I think I'll tell you one uh, tip is most of the things that we see in business today have been thought out and applied maybe in different industries. So sometimes it's good to look outside of your industry to think about how to innovate within your industry. For example, our EM emergency medical services is a fairly new industry. We've been only around since the late seventies, early eighties. Um, and so, uh, there hasn't been a lot of sophistication or innovation around like customer development or employee development. So what we looked at is who is really successful around creating unique experiences. And by the way, that word you experience has always been very, very central. In fact, it, it's, it's really been a part of our purpose statement to create exceptional experiences for our uh, patients, customers, and employees. So this word experience is incredibly important. So, you know, we worked with Disney Institute early on to understand how Disney creates magical experiences. We brought in lots of different consultants to learn and understand. What one of the biggest uh, opportunities that we uncovered is this element of understanding the journeys that people have when they interact with your product or service. And so I brought in um, a consumer brand specialist, a um, gentleman by the name John Gusev, who still works with us um, on really understanding what is the journey that your customer takes? What is the journey that your employee takes? What are the touch points along this journey? How do you ultimately elevate those? Very impactful approach. You Google journey mapping, sure you get tons of results. Very important when trying to create a good experience for the stakeholders of people that interact with your business on a daily basis. So perhaps um, I can reach out to you afterwards and maybe you can give us a list of some of the favorite books and resources or consultants that you've worked with because I know that you're a truly dedicated student of leadership and of business and it's in part what has contributed to your success. So if you'd be open to that, I'd love to follow up with you on it and put some notes in uh, the show notes when we do publish the episode. But I wanted to see if there's anything else that you want to leave our listeners with. Any uh, tips? I, I, I do. I think one of the most understated and important discoveries on this journey that I've made is that you ultimately, as a leader of the organization, have to work harder on yourself than you do at your job. And I know it's a little tough to process from that perspective, but ultimately it comes down to your personal mindset on how you're growing and learning, but not just about the skills that you acquire, not just about the leadership stuff or the finance or how do you work with the customers, but how do you think, right? How do you deal with a negative self-talk? How do you deal with negative self-beliefs? How do you ultimately work on your, uh, on your discipline? And all those tips and tricks ultimately, I think, become more powerful in your ability to impact your business than thinking it, those things are important, the structural and functional things. But how you work on yourself on a consistent basis has ultimately been probably my biggest breakthrough. And there is, um, I, I'll just leave it at that. I think working on yourself, uh, developing yourself, whether you're a Tony Robbins fan or, you know, th there is dozens of uh, uh, people that, you know, touch upon how you think your mindset and working on your mindset. I think that's what I would leave uh, the biggest aha uh, perspective in the last decade for me. Now, that's powerful. That's a um, concept of putting on your mask first. You got to take care of yourself in order to take care of others. Absolutely. Steve, this has been a wonderful conversation. I'm sure our listeners are going to enjoy it as much as I did. There's a wealth of information. And on behalf of the business circle and, of course, the Hebrew Free Loan, we're all very grateful that you were able to make this time for your support. 
for your ongoing shout out to Hebrew Free Loan. Always for driving the community and providing all these op amazing opportunities. Well, thanks again, Steve, and we'll talk soon. And thanks everybody for watching and listening, and we'll talk to you soon. Be well.